Okay, so I thought today what we could do is uh, maybe go back and revisit the article. Um, we were talking about it yesterday um, by, um, by Christopher Bennett. Um, if you've had a chance to, to read that now, um, it's, uh, it is entitled The Varieties of Retributive Experience. And it is um, a different view of retribution than the classic eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, you hurt me, I hurt you, you harm me, I'll harm you back, that kind of equivalent um, notion. It's a much more sophisticated and involved um, perspective on retribution. Uh, I think we could ask, does it reflect what retribution really is. Um, is? Has it gone so far in becoming something to make retribution, um, can I say this, attractive, that um, maybe it's not really retribution anymore? So maybe a question to ask. But I thought we might um, spend some time just going through some of the major points of this article. Uh, because it's laying out a lot of the perspectives that I think um, we, we want to convey in a, in a little course like this, okay? So um, th this article quite wisely starts off with a story, all right? Um, and this is a story about um, uh, Bryson. You remember him? Remember Bryson? Okay, so Bryson comes into work, and how is he treated? Anybody can tell me how he was treated? Yeah, he, he's ignored by people around him, and his, his first thoughts are, what are his first thoughts about that? You recall? Yeah, I came in late from work, they're upset. I, I should really pay a little more attention to getting here on time. I, uh, so he, he does that. But as the story unfolds, it turns out that um, people um, are taking a particular kind of attitude toward him. And he then has to try to figure out why, okay? So, um, can anybody just share a little bit as to why he's being treated this way? <laughs> Indeed, that, that is correct. He, he, um, uh, he has been seeing, uh, I've got to make sure the names are right here. Um, what, what's her name? Uh, Kate, yes. Um, he's seeing Kate, but um, he uh, has like a longer term relationship with Carol, I think. Is, that's the way that works, right? So he's been seeing Kate. And how do his um, um, worker colleagues feel about that with him? Th they are not happy with him. So what they do is express their dissatisfaction with him. Um, they have, his, his working colleagues have developed a reactive attitude, if you will, toward him because of something he's done. They don't approve of it. Um, they think what he's done is wrong. And um, as the as the story unfolds, um, he finally gets to the point where he, he, he realizes, doesn't he, that um, it's the, 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 the Kate and Carol story which is the reason people are acting toward him the way they are. Now, it, is this story um, easily transferable into a court case 
um, where somebody's convicted of a crime and sentenced to prison. Because that looks like retribution as well, right? Can you take this story about Kate and Carol and Bryson and just translate it into a story about, um, I don't know, a rapist, a murderer who is sentenced, a thief um, who is sent, sentenced to prison. Any, any thoughts? Any thoughts about that? Okay, that, that Uh, logically, they, they seem to be the same. I will grant that. The, the thing that's a little different between them is that the Kate and Carol and um, Bryson and his co-workers, um, he's done something wrong. I mean, people, and people think that about him, right? It, he, he has done something wrong. Um, but what's the consequence of it? He's not facing jail time for that. He's not facing the kind of retribution that would put him behind bars. He's not going to trial. He doesn't need a lawyer. He is facing um, uh, people being upset with him, and he's facing um, this um, attitude of, 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 of alienation from from his, his co-workers, but it's not quite the same because is this a repairable situation that Bryson is in? What does he need to do? Pardon? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Um, anyone else have a, have a thought? Yeah, it, it, it can be fixed. He, um, he could apologize to Carol, right? He could admit he's wrong. And um, um, as much as they're upset by, as much as Carol would be upset by the fact that he has proven disloyal, in their relationship. I think the relationship was described as long-term. So they're not married. They're not bound by that kind of formal relationship. Um, but um, he's betrayed her. And he's upset all of her friends who happen to be Bryson's co-workers. And um, um, so if he, if, he, if he broke up with Kate, went back to Carol, said, I'm sorry, I'm, um, I feel awful about this. It's terrible what I did. Forgive me. Um, it, th does, does Carol have to forgive him? Does she? No, she doesn't have to forgive him. There's no duty. If you're the victim of, um, of, of wrongdoing, you don't have a duty to forgive somebody. Um, I, 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 it would be very strange to, to hear that as moral language. Now, you could be a Christian, and um, if you're a Christian, you could claim that, yeah, my, my, the teaching of my religion is that I do have a duty to forgive. That's what Jesus taught. You know, He, he said, uh, if somebody strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek, and um, if they strike you seven times, let them, you know, um, turn your cheek seven times 70, which in the parlance of the day was meant to be like an infinite number. That's a number without end, seven times 70. So, so anything that comes as an offense to you is something that you should forgive, okay? Um, but the moral life, um, uh, and, and thinking about the moral point of view, has a little trouble with that perspective. There are conflicts that come up between, between ethics in a secular context and ethics that, that are um, offered religiously. Often they will conform. I mean, Christians and Buddhists and Muslims and Jews all think it's wrong to, to kill somebody without justification. 
Um, and, and any secular person who is a reasonable person of goodwill would agree with that. That would be one of those um, uh, normative um, principles that all of us would agree represent the moral point of view. But in terms of um, how you should respond to something like um, an offense, that could be a different um, kind of situation that, that would, would take place. So anyways, um, the point here is that the response to this situation in this story is resolvable. And we can imagine what that resolution would be um, because we can think about um, some kind of reconciliation coming. It might not come, we don't know that it will, but it's conceivable that it would come. It's a little harder at times to think about somebody going through an experience of, of guilt and um, accepting blame and, and experiencing guilt and shame for what they've done um, for something that is pursued in a criminal justice system and they're sentenced to prison, okay? And one of the distinctions between these two cases um, is that one of them's um, private or non-public and the other one is public. That the, in the public domain, um, a sentence is handed down and you serve the sentence. Now things can happen to mitigate that sentence. Um, things can um, happen to mitigate, to make easier the actual sentence you received and um, you know the length of time and all that. But it's not like in a private situation where retribution is being experienced. That's what the Carol and Kate and Bryson example is. This is a private situation where the ideas of retribution are being um, examined. Um, and it's conceivable that in that situation, things could get resolved and people could go on with their lives, right? Uh, Bryson could um, admit that he has done a terrible thing. Um, he could apologize to Carol. So he could admit that he's betrayed her, that he's proven disloyal. Um, I would think there would be some uh, shame in doing that. I think um, often when we, when we apologize for things that we've done, we are acknowledging that we've not only made a mistake, because um, that's one kind of apology, but to say I've done something wrong, I've done something that I should not have done. Um, is, is a different kind of thing. And um, as a result of, of, of that, maybe Carol says, well, it's going to take a little time for this to heal over. But I do love you. I do trust you. I, I, I want to trust you again. So let's, let's see how this works out. Oftentimes, when there's been a disruption in a relationship like that, things never get put quite right again. I mean, that's just um, um, a reality of things. Um, so, but th there is a possible resolution to this that is available in the private realm that is, doesn't seem like it's that available in the, in the public realm when we're talking about a criminal justice system and, and everything being public. Okay, so that's where this article starts. It's, it starts with this story. And um, one of the things that, um, I mean, we, we raised this question um, uh, yesterday, you know, is, is there anything good that can come of, of retribution? This is, this is a, um, an article that's, that's dealing, it's a study of retribution, and it's trying to think about um, the, the idea of retribution as having um, worthwhile and even good um, dimensions to it or good aspects to it, good um, outcomes to it. It's that, that retribution is not just about um, aiming to hurt someone, because the question did come up yesterday. If retribution is about inflicting um, 
pain or a harm on somebody, how could you ever justify that? If it's, if it's trying to uh, create, um, if, if what retribution is, is a visiting of suffering on somebody who has caused you or someone else suffering, how can that be a good thing? How can that be a good thing? And this article is trying to say, I understand, but it, it, there's a classic view of retribution where the only point of it seems to be to return like for like, to return harm for harm. And this author is saying, uh, Christopher Bennett is saying, that's not what I mean by retribution. I want to get away from that classic thing. So what he does, uh, he, he wants to admit, I think he does this at the beginning of the article, he wants to say that um, retribution is not a popular idea among people who want to think about these kinds of things, but um, um, we can rethink what retribution is if we um, start thinking about the kinds of suffering that we want to say are included in um, uh, Bennett's idea of retribution, okay? So it's not you poke out my eye, I poke out yours. Um, there's a different kind of suffering that he wants to point to, and that's what the focus of the article is on. It's on the, um, the kinds of suffering that can be caused that he says um, um, lead to a, a good end. So where he starts here, um, he, he starts off by talking about forms of uh, retributive suffering. And the, to go back to our um, situation with uh, Bryson, the first form of suffering that he experiences is this withdrawal of relationship from the people around him. He's getting the cold shoulder. He is being shunned. We talked about that the other day, yesterday. Um, he's being shunned by his coworkers. They are not happy to see him. And he picks up on that. So the first thing that Bennett wants to talk about is that um, um, through the idea of people in the moral community withdrawing their relationship from you, they are essentially expressing moral disapproval for what Bryson has done. And they're expressing moral disapproval of Bryson as a person, too, in some respects. Um, you know, one of the things we ask about in ethics is, what kind of a person are you? Well, these people are saying, you're not a very good person. You're disloyal to your friends. Um, you, you, um, you're a, a cheater and a liar. And there are lots of things that are not right about this situation. Okay, so um, resentment uh, comes into the picture. Uh, um, Carol obviously will have resentment. If he breaks up with Kate, Kate's gonna have resentment. The moral community of people who are concerned about Carol are, are going to um, uh, e express moral disapproval. So the first thing that he wants to address is this idea of alienation. This idea that the first suffering to be um, experienced in this situation is an experience of alienation, separation from the moral community. The idea that people in the moral community are, um, um, they're expressing moral disapproval, all right? This leads to blame. So uh, what happens here is that from the, the moral disapproval, um, Bryson becomes a person who is receiving um, blame, and the moral disapproval um, um, is manifest, is expressed through behaviors, and the behaviors are the, um, the alienation of Bryson, who's the offender, from the moral community. And he is receiving um, uh, 
um, the moral communities blame. All right. Uh, all right. So, what is supposed to come of this is that um, from the blame he receives from others, the moral disapproval, he is supposed to, according to Bennett, um, become aware He is supposed to become aware of what's going on, and the blame communicates the moral disapproval to Bryson. And um, the blame, then, um, is trying to communicate, according to Bennett, this is where his theory goes, it's supposed to be um, seeking to achieve some good. From the blame that is directed at Bryson, from the moral community that is alienated from him, um, some positive result is supposed to come from this. It's a way that the moral community is saying, we want you, Bryson, to share the, to become aware and share the disapproval of your behavior that all of us are presenting to you. They want to get Bryson in on the, um, so that he understands and actually shares the kind of moral um, disapproval of his behavior that everybody else is. And it's from that um, that he, well, you could, you could say that um, uh, he, he's learning to accept blame for what he does, okay? Now, that awareness leads to um, an, an awareness of his guilt. That's the awareness that he has uh, um, done something wrong. And as um, uh, Bennett talks about this, he, he, he talks about this as being pain. That guilt, um, he says this on page 155 in here. There is suffering involved in experiencing the alienation. There's suffering involved in um, having the moral community withdraw from you, um, in being shunned. There is um, in, in receiving blame and having um, the moral community communicate to you that you've done something wrong and they're all aware of it. There is suffering involved in all of these steps. And then when you get to the point where you experience guilt um, from this, and he, this is a pain, a painful thing. Um, guilt, to experience guilt, an emotional reaction to, to moral disapproval, you know, from your own consciousness, your own um, superego, if you want to go that direction. Um, uh, this, again, is the, an aspect of suffering. And as the theory plays out for, for Bennett, all of these little aspects of suffering are leading to something positive. This is all about alienation. It's all about separation from the moral community. And then this process opens up. It's an emotional process. It's an experiential process whereby you come to an awareness that you are separated from the moral community and you want back in. Okay, um, so what happens is that um, as a result of the pain of, of guilt and suffering, um, um, it can lead to you as the offender making amends and trying to restore your position into the moral community. So how can that happen? Um, uh, um, it, can, it, it can involve um, this third part, which is redemptive, it can involve things like um, uh, repentance, reconciliation.
So th those kinds of notions, um, we go through withdrawal, we go through guilt and blame, we, we get to ultimately something that's redemptive. And I think this is the, the, the positive part, that this idea of, um, uh, of retributivism is trying to get to. It's trying to get you to the point where um, you can be reconciled, not only between um, Bryson and Kate and Carol, and that whole, that's got to get worked out, but between the moral community. And um, however things wind up individually with um, Bryson and, and Carol, whether they get back together or not, that's um, not so much the issue, but the, the idea that Bryson would come to a point where he would seek forgiveness, where he would seek um, reconciliation um, is, is the important part of, uh, of, of this story for um, um, our author, Bennett. So um, how would you do this? Well, again, it comes through specific things that you would do. Um, you would offer an apology. Offering an apology can be a painful thing. Um, we in the United States, and you may have an experience like this yourself sometime, I don't know the psychology of people who are going to wind up in high office in your country, but we, ha we have a president right now who never apologizes and it actually made some news because he apologized to his Supreme Court appointment. I think it's the first time anybody's heard him do that. He does not apologize because he believes that apologies are a sign of weakness, okay? And um, this goes back to, um, oh gosh, um, <laughs> um, well, I wouldn't, I, there was an era in American history in the 1950s where we had a, um, a, a rogue senator from the state of Wisconsin who was trying to find, um, his name was Joseph McCarthy, and he had, um, um, some people who worked around him who uh, were, were uh, gosh, uh, they, they ruined people's lives, uh, accusing them of being communists working in different parts of the State Department and all kinds of things. It was part of the Red Scare in the United States. It is a part of American history that most people are really quite ashamed of. and. Um, one of the people who worked for uh, Joseph McCarthy was President Trump's um, uh, legal expert for years and years and years and gave him rules and modes of operating in the public realm. And one thing he made sure that Donald Trump thoroughly understood was that you never apologize. You never apologize. You never show a weakness. Um, Okay, but just for you to apologize for something could be a loss of face. That's the expression we use. The, the, the idea that there's, you know, you're admitting, you are admitting to um, making a mistake, um, having done something wrong, you're, you're admitting you're not perfect. Um, and there are people who do not want to do that, okay? It's peculiar that people would not want to do that. This notion that Christopher Bennett is laying out here about retributivism is actually assuming that the kinds of people who are going to get the good end out of retributivism are, are people who are of good standing in the moral community. There are people who make mistakes and get alienated from the moral community but they're basically good people who are concerned about the good and want back in if they've been ushered out by something they've done. So, um, so um, offering an apology is, is something that would be done to help affect redemption. Um, repenting, make sure that people understood and, and working towards reconciliation I'd like um, to make a question. Yes, yeah, please. Yes. Did you experience this process, Bennett tells us, happening with prisoners serving a sentence? It, 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 uh, Did you experience this process 
having the prisoners serving a sentence. Yes, and I think Bennett, um, see here's the thing about this article, um, and it's the reason I drew the, the, the distinction at the front end about the private nature of this, okay? This is taking place in a workplace. This is um, you in this room with your friends. This is not a jail, okay? Um, the, the, the point there is that this kind of retribution picture can take place in just our ordinary lives, just your life and in my life. Um, we can offend one another and we can feel bad about it, we can feel guilty about it, we can do things that create alienation between ourselves and our friends and our friends' friends and other people. Um, people can find themselves in situations like that. Um, does this process go on with people who are sent to prison? Absolutely. The problem is that Bryson may wind up with his girl and showing up at work the next day and maybe people a week from now are gonna be nicer to him because Carol's gonna say, listen, yeah, he, he was bad to me, but we've worked this out and people, okay. You know, and people are gonna start talking to him again and he's gonna get restored to the life that he knew. We throw you in prison, um, you may feel guilt and the pain of that, whatever crime you committed or whatever got you put in, in, in jail and you're aware that you've offended the moral community and you feel awful about it. Um, and, and maybe you move into the redemption area where you wanna say, I'm sorry, I, I really am sorry for this, but the sentence goes on and on and on. That it, it's not the end of the story for you. So you've got a 10 year sentence and you've been in prison and you repent of what you've done and you acknowledge the wrongfulness of it and you've still got a 10 year sentence to go through. See, that's what the that's what the point is. The the um, the story you're getting from Bennett has to do with a um, the way that the idea of um, uh, retributivism works just in our normal life. There, he's saying that this is a part of how you and I live. And I, you know, you've probably had some kind of an experience like that. Most of us, you know, people um, make mistakes and they um, offend other people. And when that happens, it's like, gosh, I haven't heard from him for a while. You know, she hasn't called me in a while. Um, you have experiences like that and you try to figure out as Bryson, what have I done here? And this whole process that Bryson went through opens up. It's an experience you can have and I can have and we've probably all had in some way or another. We've offended other people, we've done other people wrong or they've perceived something that we've done wrong and there could be a subjective side to it that, well gosh, I didn't mean that. I didn't know she was gonna understand it that way. But even then, you take responsibility for it and say, you know, you apologize, I'm so sorry that um, what I said uh, hurt your feelings. You can always say that was not my intention and that may be true, but you do something to, to try to um, reconcile yourself to the person you've offended. This is, a, this is not an uncommon kind of experience for people to have. The thing about raising issues about punishment in the public sphere is that people can go through this process and at the end of the process, the punishment just keeps going, okay? Um, you, it, it's like marginal returns. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, you know, I've heard that you have a, a kind of a nasty prison in the area, what, five, 6,000 people? The, the problem with nasty prisons is that if you keep people in them too long, the effect of the prison on people who are in them is that um, the, you wind up having to survive in those prisons and you can wind up adapting to the culture of the prison, which means that you can wind up doing things you ordinarily would not want to be doing. If you were going through some kind of a process like this, where the end of your sentence had something to do with the redemptive reconciliation piece of things so that you could get out of prison, um, that would be a healthier thing than saying you've gone through that process and you've got another five years to, to spend 
before you're even eligible for parole or something like that. So that extra time that you spend in prison is not going to make you happy and it could, hap it could wind up having a negative effect on the reconciliation and the redemptive part of things. Um, you know, I shared with you yesterday that um, the, the little prison where we send students at my university to, to do um, um, a tutoring has a 70% recidivism rate because people who get in there, um, they learn how to operate in life from people who are in prison. And when, there's, when they're put out of prison, they don't often have the resources and the services that are needed to help them get a good job and start to make it on their own and put their lives together, they may wind up hanging out with the old gang and, well, let's try to rob that bank and um, we'll get a few bucks and then I can have a better life. Um, and they, they wind up back in, in, in prison. Um, so my point is that this process is something that people go through who are sent to prison this is my answer to your question. People do go through this when they're sent to prison, but um, the kind of public punishment that we put on people um, goes beyond the end of that process, and it just keeps going and going and going. And if it goes too long, um, and it, depending on the kind of setting you're in, it can have, um, again, sort of diminishing returns, and the the benefit that you might have gained from a person being released from prison when that part of the punishment, if you will, got taken care of, that part of the suffering was dealt with, goes on and it, it winds up um, um, doing something destructive to the person where when they finally do get out, there's a good chance that they're going to wind up back in because um, uh, they had to become part of the prison culture. They had to do things to survive in prison. And uh, prison is not a happy place um, for, for anybody. And even prisons that are called country clubs and things like that, they're, they're not happy places. And there are forms of punishment that are just, um, I, I think they're sort of unconscionable. This, um, this, this case I was telling you about um, in Alabama, in the state of Alabama, this death penalty case, it's just gone up before the American Supreme Court. Uh, uh, the, the person who's um, uh, suffering from dementia, he was put, I didn't tell you this part of it, um, but he was put in solitary confinement for 30 years. 30 years. Now, if that wouldn't drive you crazy, you know, what would? Um, you know, Pascal, the great French philosopher, said the whole problem with people is that they can't spend a half an hour in a room by themselves. There's truth to that. But 30 years? 30 years with just you? Oh my God, you know. Um, that, is not, that is not a healthy situation. That is, that is a cruel, that is a cruel thing to do to a human being. Okay. Um, we have an amendment to our Constitution in the United States that prevents cruel and unusual punishment. I can't think of anything crueler and more unusual than 30 years in solitary confinement. Okay, it just, anyways, so. Well, I, I wanted to go through the, the, the heart and, and, and soul of this um, um, article again because um, it's an article about retribution but it's more than that. It's talking about things that um, as you think about punishment and you think about um, um, the kinds of moral obligations that we have, um, the kinds of people we want to be, the way that we want to hold one another accountable for things that we do, um, the way that we want to be responsible citizens and things like that. Um, they are all playing off of a movement like this. Um, and for Bennett, this is what retribution looks like. I think for a lot of people who think about retribution, this doesn't make any sense at all to them, I, I think. This is an unusual presentation of retribution. 
Um, you know, I could stop somebody on the street in the United States and say, what's retribution? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's right there in the Bible. That's what people would say. That's it. And this is not eye for an eye. This is um, a, a, a very sensitive and um, expanded uh, picture of um, people going through a process that is painful, but the, the, the pain has been caused um, by actions they have taken, decisions they have made, and the result of those actions and decisions has been to create withdrawal. It's led to pain, to a sense of guilt, and hopefully it leads to some kind of redemptive end, some kind of reconciliation, some kind of restoration of relationships within the moral community. Uh, tomorrow, I, we're going to go through um, a piece in your readings that, that I wrote about what just punishment is. There's a thing about capital punishment and, and all, but I've got a little picture of just punishment in it. And these elements are, are part of that, too. Um, I, I think that these elements are how we want to think about punishment if we want to get away from you know, a very strict and confined and classic picture out of Hammurabi's code, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Okay, you know, you know, even the it's it's amazing to me. America claims to be such a Christian country, and so many people want to take a literal interpretation of the Bible and all of that. And you ask them about crime things, and they go right back to Leviticus and say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And they sort of forget that Jesus of Nazareth, when he was walking around the dusty streets of um, various cities around Jerusalem, um, when he was asked about these things, he would say, uh, well, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And he says, but I say to you, love one another. It's a different picture of how people should be interacting with one another. It's not about eye for an eye, tooth. I mean, Jesus explicitly repudiated that, that doctrine for retribution. And in its own way, this is a defense of retribution, but it's a, it's a moral psychology that's being put up here. And I think maybe that's the way to look at it. Um, we're calling it retribution because somebody does something wrong and we're saying that there's suffering involved in taking you through a process to get you, but the end of it is restoration with the moral community, okay? It does have a positive end. That's what his case is, okay? So what do you think of that? What are your responses to that? Oh, oh I'm sorry. I got so interested in watching all this microphone stuff. I, Uh, how can I legitimate the normativity power of alienation process from an outsider from my uh, moral community? Or we are talking about a global moral community. Because how can I demand some, so, uh, the same behavior from an agent that doesn't share the same beliefs? from my moral community? Um, well, that's, that's kind of an interesting question uh, because we have to ask what a moral community is, okay? Now, how many moral communities can you live in? Um, I, I, that, that would be the first question I'd ask back at you. And I guess what I wanna do in response to your question is go back to the thing I talked about with the four little moral point of view things and go back to that one that said universalizability. That was the first one, the ugliest one. You might as well start a little course like this with the ugliest word you got and there it is. But that idea of universalizability is trying to say that wherever there are reasonable people of goodwill, you've got your moral community. It has nothing to do 
with being in uh, New York versus Rio de Janeiro versus Beijing. It has nothing to do with that. If you are a person of goodwill, you are in the moral community. All right? So when you ask me about somebody who's outside the moral community, um, what their perspective would be, um, well, I guess they could have any kind of a perspective they want because if what they're doing is offering their viewpoints from outside the moral community, I would want to know, uh, are you a sociopath? Because by definition, you're not a reasonable person of goodwill. Does, does that make sense to you? Like, uh, we're talking about private uh, in public. situations. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my doubt was uh, if we're talking about a global moral community mm -hmm. with some principles, like mm -hmm. reasonable persons, or like more relativism uh, approach. Okay, well let me ask you, do you, think, do you think Bryson in this example is somebody outside the moral community? No, no. No, I think that's right. He's never outside of it. Um, he, he never, uh, as a matter of fact, he comes to an awareness like, what do I have to do to get back in? I don't like this. Why? He's suffering. Suffering is not anything we want to experience if we can avoid it. And he's got it, and he's responsible for it, right? And he wants back in. So, um, yeah, so I, you, you look at people who break the law, um, who are offenders, and you know, I don't want to discount the reality that there are some really bad people out there. I, t I had a um, conversation one time with, um, I, I do death penalty things, and I was out in Hawaii, and a friend of mine had put me together with a person who was at one time working in the United States on the death penalty and stopped. And I wanted to meet this guy. He's, he's kind of well known in the death penalty circles. And um, so I had dinner with him over at his house in Honolulu. And, and I asked him, so why did you stop working on death penalty issues? Because when you get into the death penalty, it's, it, when you find your first person who is innocent, who is going to an execution, it is just, it's unbelievable. Anyways, it's, it's a horrible thing. But this guy dropped out. And he said um, there was a time when he, he went to a prison in Kentucky on the death row and there was a guy that he was supposed to meet and he went to meet him. And um, I, this sounds a little, I don't know, uh, sounds a little strange. But uh, he said he was a hit man. He had no conscience at all. He, he really was a gun for hire and he would kill people if you got his number and you say, I need so-and-so taken out, he would take them out. That's what he did. And he said when he sat down with this guy, he exuded some kind of evil. He had never experienced this with anybody before. And he said, um, I don't know if this was just his nervous reaction to it or something, but he said, it's like the room got cold. You know, it's like out of The Exorcist or something. Um, uh, but but there, there was like a palpable, a touchable, feelable evil around this guy. And he said, after I experienced that, I just, I could not do this anymore. I, I, it, was, it, it, it was kind of the straw, they say, that broke the camel's back. It was, he just couldn't do it. I don't want to deny that there are people out there who are so alienated from the moral community, that they really are outside of it. And um, they are people that I think we typically call sociopaths. They, um, they have severe um, psychological problems. Um, they are some kind of um, egoistic, narcissistic individuals who feel that there is no law that they have to account to except that which they devise for themselves. Um, they, are, they are not accountable to, to a moral community in any respect. Um, and this guy was, was alone. He wasn't part of a, you know, a family. Uh, you know, even if you talk about like uh, 
um, you know, a crime family, you know, who's famous, you know, um, Mario Puzo writing writing books and things like that, and Godfather movies. If if you've got a family, even there, there's a kind of moral community. They're all kind of doing bad things and stuff, but they all think they're doing good things. And even to have self-deception at play in this, you've got to be committed to the moral life to be a self-deceiver. You want to think you're, you've got to be good, even to deceive yourself. Because um, you want to tell yourself you're doing something good when what you're doing is bad. That's what you deceive yourself about, right? Um, so even if we've got a Godfather script, um, we're talking about moral community, we can make harsh judgments about it and say there's some strange stuff here that needs to go on. But the dynamics of it are still following this. If somebody does something wrong, um, they're, they're going to feel awful about this. And they're also going to feel, if I don't get this straightened out, somebody's going to put a bullet in my head or a horse in my bed you know, tomorrow morning. Um, but they're going to want some kind of reconciliation. And they're going to go through a process like this because they're not, um, they're not outside of moral community, even though they're kind of classic wrongdoers. Okay? But there are people who are outside. Um, I mean, you know, we can, we can talk about the Hitlers of history and, and, and folks like that. And there are mass murderers um, who, who, who are like that, you know. Um, um, maybe you have some favorite mass murderers in Brazil. We have some in the United States, you know, who, you know, they're, they're a mass murderer. And you just, but you also wonder about those people. Is there some kind of diminished capacity because of all this? Is somebody who is so narcissistic and and so tied up, is there some kind of therapeutic excuse that we would make? Is, does it make sense to put a person like that in prison or is there something more fundamentally wrong? I mean, those are questions we ask as a society because we have trouble understanding that people can be perverse. You know, in Western culture, there are, there are two perspectives on um, on, on moral wrongdoing, just to come at this a different way. And um, there, there is the classic um, and classical idea that we, we get from Plato, which is, you know, Socrates, um, if you don't know, if you do something wrong, why is it you do something wrong? Plato believed that goodness um, was irresistible on action. So if you knew the good, you would do it. So if you wind up doing something bad, something wrong, something evil, why do you do it? Well, you don't understand. Well, when somebody doesn't understand, what do we do? We sit them down in a classroom, you know, open up your books, start taking notes, read these books. We educate them. You need education. So our approach to evil and wrongdoing is kind of education. We're going to read an article, Moral Education. It's another theory of, of punishment. But it, it, it's, it's springing from something very classic in the, in the Western tradition, which is evil is ignorance. What do you do for ignorance? Well, you educate people. OK? I'm a teacher. Professor Denny's is a teacher. We're about trying to dispel ignorance, not only yours, but our own. OK? Okay, so that's one of the approaches that you can take to the problem of evil, is try to educate, um, educate people so that they understand. Young children don't understand when Johnny goes over and slaps his sister Mary that he shouldn't do that. Okay, so he has to learn, and we will sometimes impose a punishment. You need to go to your room. You hurt your sister. And, and it's supposed to have an educative effect when you do that. But we're trying to educate. Well, OK, evil is ignorance. What comes along is Christianity, OK? And Christianity proposes something different. Um, if you go into the uh, Book of Romans in the New Testament, um, I don't have a Bible with me, but, but uh, St. Paul says, the good that I would do, I do not do. Okay, and the question is why? And um, he basically gives you a different theory of wrongdoing and evil. He says, I can know the good 
I can know it. I can understand what the good thing to do is and refuse to do it. Okay? So now, evil is not ignorance. He's claiming, I got the, I know what I'm doing. Um, I got the education piece of this. I'm just not doing it. So now we have a theory of evil as perversity. If you know what the good is and you don't do it and you refuse to do it, or you do it because you know it's wrong, that's perversity. Classic example of this in literature is a short story written by um, Edgar Allan Poe. I don't know if people read him anymore, but it's a little story called The Black Cat. And um, it's a, you know how he's always, um, you know, walling up. He's got these crazy um, husbands who are putting their wives in the wall and walling them up and all that. Well, well, this is a story about a guy who does that. And um, there's this black cat who is um, um, kind of watching him, and it's, it symbolizes all kinds of things in this guy's fevered brain and, and all that. So this guy kills his wife and all that, and this cat is just getting on his nerves and getting on his nerves, and he finally takes the cat and hangs it, hangs it. And the reflection in the text about this is, is something like this. He says, yeah, I know this was really an awful thing to do, he says, I know it was the wrong thing to do. And he says, that's why I did it. That is evil as perversity. It's a classic expression of evil as perversity. And it's a different theory. And it's a different kind of thing. There are people um, who don't understand what the right thing to do is and can be educated. Okay, Every child is a Greek child. They need to be educated into the moral life. Okay, they need to be entered into the, the moral community and learn all those normative principles. They don't have to learn about universalizability when they're three years old, but they do have to learn that it's not right for Johnny to hit Sally, okay, just because he feels like doing it or something, you know, or you took my piece of candy or whatever. Um, so every child is a, is a Greek child, but we can get into the adult world and, um, and we can find perversity. We can find people who um, do something wrong knowing that it's wrong and then doing it because they know it's wrong. That's, you know, and it's, it's interesting because we, we have trouble understanding that. I do. Because if somebody knows something's wrong and they um, are doing it because they know it's wrong, that almost makes me think that they're ignorant again. <laughs> that boy, what is it you don't get? I mean, I, what is it to encounter that? But, but again, I would go back to this um, this person I met, who, who met the the cold room and all that. I, there are evil people. There are evil people, you know. And and not everybody is going to be subjected and will benefit from a process that yields to reconciliation, okay? Um, there are some lost souls amongst us. And that's, it's very sad to think about that, but, you know, uh, it's, I don't know, maybe you have disagreements with that. I, we all have different experiences we bring to these questions. So, um, please. I, uh, well, uh, I do think that there is people there is evil people, but I okay. think there is that is is not an absolute to say that if someone knows that something is evil and it is doing uh, one uh, a knowing that this is evil and b because this is evil, okay. I think that in this case it is not so out of the box if you if if we we go into a utilitarian point of view because i think in this in the real life sometimes you 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 don't get to be as so benevolent as you wish you could be 
So let me give you an example can, of the politics. Can I just politics. be clear? You're, you're saying that, that people fall short of the ideals that they have? Is that what you're saying? That if I have an ideal of benevolent behavior or benevolence towards other people and I wind up falling short and I'm not as kind to people as I think I should be, yeah. is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Okay, all right. So okay. Why people do that, I think that uh, a practical case is is the is the political life, uh, and when in your when when you do politics, sometimes you you do have you do have to make net net things because you you have you have an end that you want to get to. So, uh, I, what I'm trying to say, uh, this is not a, I think this is not a so absolute point of view. Uh, people know that it is evil. They do, they do this knowing that it is evil and because it is evil. Of course that mm, you wish you, you wish you could do the other way, but sometimes it, you just can do it. Okay, I thank you. That, that's um, interesting. I it's an interesting perspective on that. I, I mean, if any of you, the rest of you want to comment on that, I think this is a in, very interesting issue to open up. I will say um, well, one thing that comes um, to mind on this for me um, is again the self-deception thing, but also the Greeks had this idea, um, acrasia, um, about weakness of will, that um, you can sort of, and I think this is um, kind of what St. Paul is talking about. Um, I wouldn't say this to a biblical scholar because, you know, they don't like anything that's not, you know, biblical. Um, but this idea of weakness of will that you could, um, you could know what it is you're supposed to do, um, but you, for various reasons, just haven't got the gusto to get there. Um, and it's not that you're intentionally trying to do something evil, it's that um, you, you are lacking um, the ability to, um, to live up to an ideal that you, you may even hold. Yeah, but also in a proper, yeah, but also in a Machiavellian point of view, uh, sometimes things had, had to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, and you got to do it. Just that. Mm, okay. That was my point. Okay. Okay, um, are you talking about coercion? The idea that somebody could force you to do something that you don't want to do, and if you don't do it, worse things could happen. So you wind up doing something that's bad in your own eyes, but it's to prevent something worse from happening. Is that, okay. Yeah, that, um, again, I, I think that's, that's a reality. I, I think, yeah, I th some of these things I think are almost empirical. I, I think those kinds of things can happen. Um, you know, if, um, uh, well, we can, we can think of all kinds of examples for, for things like that. Um, but um, I, I would look at that example as being um, somebody who is coerced into doing something they don't want to do and they know that what they're being asked to do 
is wrong. And um, you could circle back to weakness of will, that I'm lacking um, the, um, the will power, if you will, um, to do what I think is right. Now, we do have moral heroes in the world and in our lives, and these are people who um, are being told that the, the way to go is to submit to those coercion, do something you think is wrong, um, but it will prevent something worse from happening. And there is also something else in St. Paul, okay? Because uh, I think he also was trying to create a world of moral heroes, but he said, you should not do evil, that good might come. It may be a very good thing that um, all kinds of people don't get killed because of um, something that you do that you think is wrong, but it prevents this other thing from happening, which is even worse. If you were running a utilitarian or consequentialist calculus, you would say more good comes to more people and to the moral community by doing this wrongful thing than by doing what I think is right. And that's one of the issues that's brought up about utilitarianism as a philosophy, it has no principles, okay? And Kantianism is filled with principles, you know? If it violates the moral law, can't do it. Well, what if all sorts of people are gonna die? I'm not responsible, you know? If I come across, I'm out in the jungle and I come across somebody who's holding 20 people hostage and, and um, the guy puts me under a gun and says, um, I'm gonna give you a pistol and um, you have to shoot um, an innocent person and if so, um, I'll let you all go and if you, uh, if you don't, I'll kill all of you plus you. I'll kill all of them, 21 dead. Well, on a utilitarian calculus, we all go, give me the gun. You know, I'm gonna save 20 people's lives in my own life by, well, I'll save 19 lives plus my own by killing an innocent person. But a Kantian would say, um, can't do it. I am not responsible for you doing something evil and wrong. That's on you. So a Kantian, a real strict Kantian, a Kantian can't tell a lie. You know, the supposed right to tell a lie for you know, good motives, not for Kant. You, you are not permitted to do evil that good might come. You can't violate the moral law to some end. Um, that, that, that violation is going to lead to some good end. He's not a consequentialist, and Kant would be the person who says, you don't know what the end is going to be, and you are not responsible for another person's evil actions if they decide to do that. So these are where, you know, the lines come down in, in Western ethical thought, you know, kind of, these are enlightenment ethics, and this is one reason in the 20th century, uh, you know, 40, 45, 50 years ago, um, there were, there were, um, moral philosophers in the West who just said, I can't do this Kantian stuff anymore. I can't do this utilitarianism anymore. Give me the Greeks. I want to go back and start thinking about, instead of what should I do, I need to think about what kind of a person I'm supposed to be. So um, there's been an, uh, you know, a movement. Um, oh gosh, all kinds of people are involved in it. You know, Philip of Foot and um, Anscombe at the uh, at um, Oxford, you know, all these all these people kind of went the route of vices and virtues, uh, axiological ethics, if you will. And um, there have got to be some better ways to sort out these these, these questions. Um, so, and, and part of the, part of the problem with all that is that these ethical theories are presented to us in ways that make us think that you you've got to sign on to one of them, and if you sign on to one of them, you can't possibly involve get involved in another one. So if you're a, a utilitarian, you, you can never have a principled position on something. You always have to run the calculus and figure out, you know, greatest good for the greatest number. You can't just say lying is wrong, you, you know. And I'm not sure that we have to be so strict with these philosophies. That's one reason I, uh, I'm gonna talk to you tomorrow a little bit about uh, my own work and, and um, what natural law means to me and um, we were having a conversation about it, doesn't necessarily <laughs> hang everything on God.
I don't necessarily approach natural law that way. But it does kind of hang everything on reason. And what would a reasonable person do, that kind of thing. So, um, and as we, we saw in some of our readings today, um, uh, in Darwell, piece, there is some kind of connection between um, accepting a command from God and what the relationship of that is to the moral community. Because if I read him right, and I'm not claiming I understand this perfectly, because I, I don't, but I think Darwell is saying that before you can even understand a commandment from God, you have got to have a, a notion of a moral community where we are obligated to one another, where we are um, in relationship to one another, and we, have, um, um, we are accountable you to me, me to you. And only after you have that in place can you talk about a transcendent other, that we have to start with the moral community that we, that we experience in this life and that we have here before we can talk about transcendent realities. That's not the way religious people who come at this issue think about it. So it's a different kind of perspective. We'll, we'll chat a little bit more about that. Um, were there other comments? I, I appreciate the, the interaction here with us. Please. Oh, hi, Professor. Um, what happens if someone uh, commit an abuse or moral contravention? I, uh, I, didn't, I just didn't hear that. What happens uh, if someone commits an abuse or moral contravention, but no one knows? What is a moral vacuum? Well, um, you know, I, there, there was a, um, uh, an article that you weren't required to read. It's in your, your packet. It was on humiliation. But one response to that is that... Um, the, the, the ring the jits? Ring jits? Ring of jits? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, I, yeah. But the response to it is that the, the justice system is being humiliated. When, when that happens, okay? Um, if a person commits a murder and we don't find out who did it, if we can't hold a person accountable for it, that um, that's a failure. See, Kant, Kant believed that if you committed a murder, um, you should um, drop what you're doing and, and go down to the local police station and turn yourself in. And when they execute you, you should step right up and take your punishment. That's what Kant thought, that um, the moral law is so commanding that it would lead a person of reason to that position, okay? That is to say, there are different responses. Um, there, um, it, it, um, I, I would think that a lot of people who might commit a murder, this is an unjustified killing, would not want to be caught. And I think there is some actual evidence that most people who do commit murder do so because they believe they won't get caught. You know, that's where the deterrence piece of utilitarianism falls apart. Um, because, um, you know, um, utilitarianism really wants to focus on the welfare of the community, greatest good for the greatest number. And the way we do that is by punishment of people who are wrongdoers, right? And the way we create a safe and secure society for the greatest number of people is to deter and stop people from committing crimes like murder, okay? So, um, so what happens if somebody gets away with murder, you know? Um, what is the implication of that? So there, it, it, you know, from, from most theories of punishment that we have, that is not a, a good thing. But um, most people who commit murder actually think they will not get caught. And there's some very strong evidence in the criminological literature about this, okay? Um, they think they will not get caught and it's what allows them to move forward. On the other hand, a lot of murders are committed, homicides are committed 
in a moment of passion. And um, um, I don't know, I have never heard, I, this is true, I have never heard anybody say, I was going to kill him, and then I thought, the death penalty. If I do this, I might get executed myself, so maybe I'm not going to do it. I've never heard anybody say that. I've never heard anybody say that they knew somebody who said that or thought that. The idea of the deterrence business, um, people who commit a murder, that was the crime you used, um, don't think they're going to get caught. And the reality is there, there's a, a whole percentage of homicides that are committed. I don't know if it's like 20% or 30% or something. Um, I don't get me on the numbers. Um, but it's a pretty large percentage of homicides that are committed where we don't know who did it. Okay. So the question then is, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there are people out there who are not being held accountable. And... Um, um, you know, how, how do you think about that? Um, so um, they're in, morally, they're in violation of, um, uh, of any ethical theory we can bring to bear. I mean, a utilitarian won't support murder, a Kantian won't, a virtue ethicist won't, a contractarian won't, um, a natural law person won't support murder. You know, it's a killing that cannot be justified. So um, um, if somebody is not um, punished, it means that there is some kind of failure in the practicalities of, um, of justice administration. And um, it means we need better detectives. And um, I, I don't think you want to have murderers running around because if you've done this once and got away with it, maybe you think you'd do it again. And then there's some then there's some concern about all that utilitarian business that yeah, you know that there is something that needs to be taken into account there. What does it mean to have a safe and secure society? So yeah, I don't know if that, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to your question, but but um, I, actually I think it's not. But um, but the, but the re you, because there's an empirical piece to your question. And the empirical reality is that there are people, and actually quite a number of them, who do get away with murder, who kill people and are never caught for it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Do you, um, do you buy this um, as a theory of retribution? Do you, okay. Do you, do you like it? Do you think it's true? Um, no, not working? There you go. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, taking João's question, uh, in Middle East, we have child uh, wedding. Uh, their moral community doesn't blame this action, but I think ours do. Uh, how, how could I judge universally uh, this kind of actions if just the moral community can blame the, the action? Um, you, you catch me up on the front part of what you said, you, your example. Um, Child a wedding. Uh, Middle East countries, some of them. Ch child weddings. Is that yeah. What you, okay. Uh, okay. They, their moral community don't don't blame this action, but I, I think moral community as a each country have their own or c culture. Okay. Well. Um, <laughs> okay. Can I defend child weddings? Um, uh, Interesting question. It does, it, it, one of the things that you're, you're raising here as an issue is um, um, the moral community versus particular kinds of practices that can take place in culture. Now, um, we live in a, 
in a pluralistic world, we live in a diverse world, there are all kinds of things that go on in this world. And um, they can have different kinds of meanings in different cultures and um, 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 and we have to think through, uh, I mean, this is raising for me the whole question, I, I mentioned this yesterday about relativism, okay? Um, so, so there's a practice in another society, um, a cultural practice, namely an older man um, marrying a child bride, okay? And you find that objectionable. I find that objectionable. Okay, and I would have reasons, reasons for that. Okay, that's, that's an important piece of this when you start sorting this thing out. But let's use a different example. Let's use this example um, to start off. Now, I live in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in the United States, and when I sit down to have my dinner, I grab a fork and I eat with a fork. And, um, when um, a person in Japan sits down to have um, dinner, he or she will grab chopsticks. Now, from my very restricted view, I've tried to use chopsticks and I can't hold them and they just fall apart and I, I can use chopsticks. But, and I think, well, what a, what a silly way to eat using chopsticks, you know, who couldn't use a fork? Now, so part of the thing here is that there is diversity in the world around different kinds of practices. Some people eat with forks, some people eat with chopsticks. Does it amount to anything morally? I think not. It's just a reflection. It's a, a description of the diversity of the world. Um, can people have different kinds of customs related to to marriage and childbirth and blah, blah, you know, different kinds of things. And I think, again, um, empirically, yes, okay? Just, it's a diversity question. It is, it is about the fact that in some cultures, this is what they do. In another culture, they do something else. And they may not even like what each other does when, when it comes down to it. But does it, does it amount to anything morally? The chopsticks and fork thing, I think, doesn't amount to anything morally. You know, if you've never used chopsticks, then you should learn how to use them. You know, when you get to go to Japan or China, if you're fortunate enough to do that, you will, you know, just going down to a local place. I'm sure if you get Chinese food here, do they give you chopsticks? You know, you probably know how to do it. You know, you've been, and, and you've been told, I'm sure, that this is good that you, you should be exposed to the diversity of the world. At my university, we encourage students, if they're able to do it, to try to have an experience in another culture while they're in college. Um, it's, not everybody can afford to do it, not everybody can pull it off, but we encourage it um, because we think it's important for your education to be exposed to other cultures and other practices, okay? So again, it's a reflection of the diversity of the world and it makes you um, have a broader view of things. Because what we want to have graduating from my university are people who think, yeah, I, I eat with a fork, but if you do chopsticks, that's fine. That's, you know, I like to do that too, you know? That's where we want people to be. We want people comfortable in the world, aware of what other people do and how they live. And, um, and again, it's part of the diversity of the world. The moral question um, about uh, of this is, well, there are diverse practices and there are things that go, around, go on in the world that um, we find morally objectionable. You know, one of the places this comes up in, in bioethics, medical ethics, has to do with uh, um, um, uh, the performance of a female circumcision. I mean, it's, it's, this is starting to be a question with male circumcision now because of this, but um, are there reasons to object morally to female circumcision? Um, there are if you go into the literature, there are different kinds and details about that. 
goodness, I'm not going to go into that or show slides or anything. Um, so, but but the point the, the the point is there are practices that um, you can be told about and say, well, is this right or wrong? And what does it mean to say I think this is wrong? I think what it means, if we do live in a moral community, if you say, I think female circumcision is wrong, you're saying it's universally wrong, okay? It's wrong if you do it in Seattle, where uh, surgeons, a, a medical community, wanted to deal with a um, Muslim community in, living in Seattle, and they said, if you come over to our hospital, we will provide a ritual nick on um, female genitalia so that it satisfies the religious requirement. It turns out this isn't really a religious requirement, at least it's not coming from the Quran. Um, uh, but there are a lot of Muslims who think it is a religious requirement. Um, but we will provide a medically sterile situation where we provide the nick. You are satisfying the cultural demand that a woman, um, a girl, go through this. And um, um, there was so much outrage in the community in Seattle that the hospital couldn't do this. The moral community was up in arms, if you will, or this part of the moral community. And then you have this other moral community tied up with um, uh, Muslim practice. Okay, um, this is a so this is an interesting issue because the the female circumcision, the clitorectomy kind of thing, is a widespread practice throughout the world. Are we in any position to make a judgment about that, a moral judgment? Um, if, it's, if the springs for it are religious, are you telling somebody that their religion is wrong? Is that what you're doing? Um, and that, be, that becomes a really tricky issue to get involved in. Um, but if you were to do a moral analysis of this, um, you know, you, you, you would start to look at, um, are the people undergoing this medical procedure, which in some places is done with dirty Coke bottle ends, okay? You know, broken Coke bottles. It's not like Seattle's hospital is open up for this, but this is something that's, eh, come on, we gotta take care of you. And You know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of a crude, and infections take place, and people die from this, okay? Um, so you could raise issues that, um, there is no consent for a person who's doing this. It's being performed on people really under the age of consent, where they're um, sufficiently mature to, to do this. Um, uh, you, you could start to build a case to say that this is um, a violation of um, of women's rights and things like this. It, it, you, can, you can make that, that kind of a move and you could draw a judgment that this is wrong. Now, are you, are you seeing a conflict between two moral communities? I think what you're seeing is a conflict within a moral community about the meaning and nature of a practice, okay? Because um, both of them um, the critics and the proponents are trying to do something that um, is, is meant to be honoring um, the teachings of a tradition, which all of us can understand. Um, the question is, are there moral grounds to see in that some, some kind of violation? Um, you know, I was just mentioning Plato here. You've all heard the expression platonic love. You've heard that expression? Do you know what that means? Well, you probably mean that platonic love means that, um, oh, I fell in love with my teacher and, and um, oh, we, we don't, we talk. We have coffee sometimes, but oh, we never touch. There's no, there's nothing sexual going on. About, well, that's what we think platonic love is, right? Well, you know what platonic love was for Socrates? Older man, younger boy. Highest form of love, highest form of love in Greek society, older man, younger boy, okay? That was it. We call that, in, you know, in English, pederasty. And that not only will get you thrown in jail, it'll get you killed in jail. If they know in American jails, if you are known to be a child abuser, you will get killed, 
Okay, that's why they put child abusers in solitary confinement, away from the general population of a prison and all of that, okay? But that, in Greece, was the highest form of love. Now, there's a lot to sort out with a question like this, but is it better that today we do not endorse this form of love? Younger, and, and say that this is something that just receives societal sanction. You could say that the fact that we don't do this today represents a kind of moral evolution. And there is such a thing as moral evolution. In the United States, well, and Brazil has a history of this too. Slavery was a part of the history, okay? Is it better today that there is no slavery in the United States and in Brazil? Absolutely. See, that one we don't have to have disagreement with. There's such a thing as moral evolution, okay? Um, we can, so um, these, these are practices um, that we, we do, and we can make moral judgments about them, and our judgments can be clouded um, at various times, and we need to achieve greater moral clarity, um, so we have to keep working at them. In the United States, we had anywhere from six to 800,000 people killed settling the slavery issue. We went to war over that one. And people, that wasn't about, it was about slavery. There's no question about it. If we had not had slavery, we would not have had a civil war. Um, but that was how that issue got, got settled. Um, and um, uh, we still have racial discrimination in the United States, and it's a pretty serious problem, but we don't have slavery. Um, so, um, um, when I think uh, you, you've raised a very um, uh, troubling and complex question, as far as I'm concerned, because I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about this and, and um, working with with students on this question. But I think the way you pose this, um, my response would be that um, we we do want societal sanctions for um, for marriage. I think that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, there are people who are being kept away from those sanctions. Um, in the United States, we just um, passed some laws that legalized same-sex marriage, which expanded, um, and, and the, the person who made the decision on that thought that this has to do with respecting people's dignity. If you're a gay person, um, a lesbian, if you're a, um, and you want to be married, and um, in a same-sex partnership, and the the law is preventing this from happening, um, then the law is interfering with your dignity. And that's why the Supreme Court overruled that. Whether they would do that today, <laughs> you know, like two years later, I don't know. We got a new guy on the Supreme Court who doesn't seem to hold some of these views. Um, but that's how that got worked out. So um, you have a practice like marriage, and it is a practice within society, how this gets regulated and how we think about it. And there are societies where you will not see same-sex marriage. I don't think you have it in, here in Brazil, do you? Um, same-sex marriage? Yeah. So I mean, we didn't have it as of two years ago either. Um, so there's diversity around those kinds of things. But the idea of marriage um, seems to have play and currency in, in the moral community. That, that's a way that um, people can bind themselves to one another um, to share a life, and that is a good thing. Um, how the practices work out um, depends upon um, moral evolution, perhaps. It depends upon a greater understanding of the facts. Um, um, you know, and, and you know, there, there, are just, there are just a lot of questions that, 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 that come up around that. But I think my general answer to that would be that it's not necessarily two moral communities in collision with one another. Um, it's more about, if it's a moral community, it's a, it's a universalizing community. Okay, it's the first principle up there. It's a community willing to universalize things. And um, there are practices that we're not willing to universalize, but there are bigger ideas that we are. There are normative principles that we are willing to universalize, that, that friendship and love are goods of life that everybody should participate in, and that your life is impoverished if you do not have friends. 
okay? So every culture wants to have friends and wants to support friendship. Marriage is all tied up with that. And there can be cultural practices that we disagree with. And there are things that come up where you, you just say, I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. Um, I've had students, be, because they've adopted a kind of relativism perspective, who say to me, who are you to say Hitler was wrong? Hitler, you know, was at a certain point in history, you weren't there, and he um, put his country back together. You know, after the First World War, it was a mess, and he, he got the, um, um, the industries going again. It, yeah, it was around war and all that, and, and, it, and I disagree with him. Don't get me, they always say that. But don't get me wrong, I'm not, you know, I, I don't like him, but um, that's me at a different time. I'm not really in a position to say that. And, and all I can say in response to that perspective is, yes, you can. Hitler was a bad actor. He killed a lot of innocent people, and we do not have room in the moral community for people who kill, um, uh, who undertake genocide like that. Um, yeah, you really can. There are things that um, um, you stand up and say no to, and you, it may appear that you're violating cultural sensitivities. What you're really doing is saying there is a moral community and there are practices that people undergo that violate it. There are people who object to um, female circumcision because it is um, abusive to women. It is gender focused and it is abusive to women. It, it is performed without consent um, on, on children and um, it causes harm. Um, and um, when people come along, well, we can make it safer and all that. The fact is that it's still a practice um, that, that can wind up causing serious harm to people. So, so that's a long, I, I'm sorry, but, that, but that's, that's actually, it's an important question and it's a big question. Um, and it can come up around punishment issues too because um, what constitutes um, a viable punishment? What is a proportionate? punishment and it can be affected by all sorts of things in a culture and can you ever look at another culture and say that punishment is immoral well, I think I think in Alabama putting a guy in solitary confinement for 30 years is an immoral thing to do it's immoral um, to do that to a human being and the fact that he doesn't know how to use a toilet anymore as a result of that experience is you know who's responsible for that um, my god um, should we take a break? Yeah, let's let's take. Okay, take a break. Has to say about that. I would um, I would like to turn to a couple of things that we were going to talk about today. Um, I, I will share with you that um, uh, when I, if you if you've seen this syllabus kind of thing that we have, um, I had five days laid out because originally that's what the the prospect was going to be, and it turns out we're going to have four days, and. Um, so um, one thing I, I do want to, um, to share with you, just because um, I've come all this way you know, to talk with you, and, and um, I do have my own perspective on some of these issues, and it, it comes through a, I'm sorry, it comes through a, yeah, just wave. It comes through a natural law tradition, and um, I have, I think, um, a perhaps unusual idea of how natural law works. Um, it works for me, and it may not um, be something that um, you, you recognize. It's a much simpler and humbler notion of natural law than what um, you can find elsewhere. But I've generated um, a lot of my own work in ethics um, out of a model, okay? And I would like to um, present that to you um, uh, tomorrow. So there is an article um, it's my it's um, it's it's actually for class day number four, but I would like to talk about it tomorrow. Um, and you don't it's 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 called capital punishment and just punishment. And when I let the um, uh, uh, well, I guess it's the air conditioning. When I let the Fulbright people know that I was very interested in in um, being a part of this, um, one of the things I said was that. I have developed a, a theory of just punishment, 
Um, it's actually a short little theory, but there's, a, I think, a lot that goes into it, and I would like to um, present that to you for your inspection and your criticism. So um, this is just to let you know we can, we can kind of stay on topic, but um, I, I would like to um, pay some attention to that. Um, it, it's also an article that deals with capital punishment, and um, it deals with some of the legal issues that come up in the United States. But the more, the more important part of that um, particular um, selection is, I like the cool air. <laughs> <laughs> the, the more important part of that selection is the is the part that's dealing with just punishment. So I think uh, maybe tomorrow I will I will share that, and then the the fourth day we'll try to put as much stuff in as we can around emotions and some of the other theories that um, we're we're playing around with. Okay, so um, um, I will say that one of the profound things out of the, um, the Bennett article is that at the very end of it, um, he, he reaffirms the idea that um, um, alienation is, is one of the central pieces of um, retribution, as he understands it. It's one of the experiences of suffering. And then he concludes by saying that the offender is one of us. And um, by saying that, he is saying that the offender is in the moral community. And I think that's one reason I say it in response to this, this last question we had before the break, that um, we can have um, disagreements within the moral community. We can have diverse practices in the moral community, and those diverse practices may have different kinds of moral meaning. And um, they may be so different or so provocative that they lead us to draw moral conclusions, okay? And some of those conclusions um, will and should appeal to um, moral ideas that we, that we hold. So um, anyways, one of us. Uh, the, uh, we had, uh, there were a couple of things uh, for today. Uh, I'll just try to keep this uh, moving along here. There were two articles uh, that, one was um, the Angelo Corlett article uh, dealing, again, it was dealing with re retributivism. And the other one was uh, the, uh, the, the Darwall, the Darwall piece, okay? And um, I just need to find that article real quick. I thought I had all this straight. Every day is a different color, and, and uh, as you can see, and uh, I just want to make sure that I maybe, I, maybe I left it in my, in my, my room. So, shoot. Well, Well, I don't, I don't seem to have that easily accessible. I do have the correlate article, but the Darwall piece is, is important. And it's picking up on the Strawson piece that we talked about um, the other day. And I, I made a couple of notes, and I, um, um, I, I find Darwall um, exceedingly interesting and difficult to understand, and I don't claim to be any kind of an expert on, on his thought. Um, but there were a couple of um, uh, points that I, I thought were major points. Um, you know, maybe I can, I can just say, say this, is that um, uh, moral obligation for Darwall is um, equal accountability. The question was raised about responsibility and accountability yesterday. And um, how are we accountable and to whom are we accountable? And it seems to me that running through Darwall is this notion um, of a moral community. He uses that language at times, and it's important language. Um, there is such a thing as a moral community. It, um, it transcends cultural differences. It transcends the diversity of the world, okay? Um, and it affirms the equal dignity of persons. 
So it is a, um, it is a, a perspective that we can easily associate with Kantian thought. Um, Kantian uh, you know, ethics wants to affirm um, the, the, the human person, and I, I mean, one version of the categorical imperative has to do with respect for persons. What is a person? Complex issue. Um, but personhood, in a Kantian sense, and I think for Darwell would, would accept this, it's, so, it's sort of like an office you hold, okay? Um, I used to use this example, and I'll use it here, but it used to mean more than it does to me right now. Um, but in, in the United States, um, the tradition is that if the President of the United States walked into a room, we would all stand up. Why? It's out of respect for the office. Okay? Now, we have had some questionable people who have held that office over the years. Um, but, um, and, and there have been some people who've gotten in some um, serious trouble. They've had scandals, blah, blah, and they've had limitations. We've had um, presidents who have alcohol problems. We've had presidents who um, were not faithful to their spouses. Um, um, but no matter who the president is, if he walks in the room, you stand up. And it's out of respect for the office. Personhood is like an office that you hold, okay? Um, you do not have to be a perfect person. You simply need to be um, a person. You just simply need to be a human being to, to hold that office. Um, you hold that office through different states of consciousness. Every night when you go to sleep, um, you are not fully conscious. Um, and you're still a person and recognized as such by the moral community. You could be in a, um, a coma and you would still be regarded as a person. You could be gestating in the womb and be regarded as a person. That happens in different ways for different um, uh, traditions and under different, under different laws. Um, and even um, religious communities have different views about that. Um, you know, in Roman Catholicism, as you all know, um, person, personhood, in a sense, is, is recognized from the moment of conception. In Judaism, in, in, in forms of classic Judaism, your personhood is achieved when you are crowning, when you are coming out of mom. It, it's that late. It's the ninth month, and you're coming out. Uh, and um, the old tradition was that the father is there to put the first breath into the newborn. It's passing on the spirit, the ruach, to, to the infant who is born. So there are these different differenting views. And my, um, one of my own positions on the abortion question is that when it was, um, it was decided um, on, some, on, on the wrong grounds when it was decided in the United States, uh, because I thought it should have been uh, decided on religious grounds, religious freedom grounds, because there are different theories about when um, a developing form of human life deserves to be recognized as a person, and there is no consensus. And science cannot determine that. Science cannot determine that. Personhood is a moral question. It is not a scientific question. That's the, if you get nothing else out of me, get me that, you know. Um, and it leads to interesting questions with respect to the death penalty. Um, do you show respect to a person who has been convicted of a capital crime by killing him? So there's a, you know. Anyways, um, Darwall talks about the equal dignity of persons and um, we have equal standing to make demands on one another and to recognize those demands. Um, and there, there was a question that came up in the readings, and you may have your own questions, and I'm happy to um, chat with you about Darwall or let you chat with one another about Darwall. Um, um, but there was a question about um, um, God that comes up in that little selection I offered you from Darwell's book. And um, as I understand it, and I, I'm not even claiming that this has captured him, I'm, I, 
I've just told you, I'm not sure I got all this um, from him, but it struck me that what Darwall is claiming is that if you get your sense of obligation from a divine command from God, that even that sense of obligation depends upon, I think he called it a background notion of second personal um, understanding. Again, Darwall's case is that um, uh, we, we live in moral community and the basis for our um, sense of moral obligation comes from um, what the second person, what the you out there um, uh, recognizes as an obligation and accountability in me and what I uh, um, experience and hold accountable in you. So um, again, as we talked about this yesterday, first person um, obligations um, spring from this kind of Kantian notion of autonomy, you know, the autonomous self um, that, that Kant believed that an individual consciousness, and this is the enlightenment and liberal focus on the individual and the um, importance of the individual, that you have access to the moral law. As, and, you ha and, and autonomy is a major Kantian notion that plays off that, and it, it's playing off of the idea of the first person. The um, utilitarian view, just to repeat what I said yesterday, is kind of a third person notion. It's impersonal. When we're trying to figure out the obligations that we have um, in the third person, we take the perspective that um, what is good and right and fitting to do is that which maximizes utility for the greatest number of people, greatest good for the greatest number shorthand for utilitarianism. That's third person stuff. It's impersonal. It's impersonal. Okay, greatest good for the greatest number. So I'm, uh, if I'm an act utilitarian, I'm gonna tell a lie right now, because again, there are no principles. You know, if you're a rule utilitarian, it, this is, you fudge all this. But if you're an act utilitarianism, there are no principles you have to abide by. So if I decide to tell a lie, um, for what I think to be a good end, it will be the end of maximizing um, utility, goodness, happiness for the greatest number. Again, it's all impersonal, third person. First person, you know, the autonomous self and all that. Second person is where Darwall comes down. And um, I, I mentioned yesterday Martin Buber's book, um, I'll just, I'll just Martin Buber's book is called I Thou, and we had a conversation about that yesterday. Um, so our sense of moral obligation um, comes from this idea of equal accountability. It is a horizontal picture of moral obligation. He raises a question about a vertical obligation, the question of God, and I'm, I'm just throwing this out because I'm interested in this, and I want to understand this better, and if you've got some insights, um, fill me in. Um, and if you don't want to talk about this, we'll move on to something else. But it seems to me that he's arguing that if an obligation is given to you from a transcendent source, that even that depends upon a prior sense of second person obligation, okay? So think about that. Um, we can go into the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and find in Leviticus um, um, some commands from God. You shall not kill, by which we mean you shall not commit an unjustified killing. I mean, it really is a, an anti-murder state. You shall not commit an unjustified killing. And, um, okay, uh, so um, if, 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 if that's the case, 
Um, that's God's word to you. If I understand Darwell correctly, we already had that. We already had. We didn't need um, a stone tablet to come down from Mount Sinai to tell us we should not commit unjustifiable killings. We don't need a stone tablet to tell us that we should not steal from one another. If um, the boat we're on crashed on, a, on an island and we had to all find a way to live together and we had a big meeting, um, what would we come up with out of our rational resources? We have to live together. We've all got to contribute to finding fresh water and a food supply. And by the way, let's not kill one another. And by the way, let's not steal from one another. Wouldn't we as reasonable persons come up with those kinds of things? It, it's, the, the, I think what, what Darwell is saying is actually a very provocative notion because he's not trying to dismiss the idea that, um, that the idea of God or, or religion plays an important part in how we think about moral obligation. He's saying that even when we think about a transcendent relationship, um, something that's going vertical, even that depends upon the moral obligations that are generated out of second person reality, second person relationships. In other words, um, to put this bluntly, um, ethics comes before um, religious ethics or rational ethics, in a sense, comes before religious ethics, okay? It's not to disparage religious ethics. It's not to disparage or, or downplay the importance of religion or of God. Um, but it, it's not saying that everything goes first to God and then comes down. It's saying things come down from God, but they are receivable because we had this all in place before we got them. Okay, the kinds of things that would come down to us, you know, there are, I'm talking about the Ten Commandments here, and there are three of them that are particularly religious, you know, keep the, keep the Sabbath day holy. That's not something on the island that we would come up with, okay? We, we wouldn't come up with that. We would need some instruction on that. And there are 613 commandments in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, that are attributable to um, divine source, okay? And a lot of them have to do with purity rituals. Um, they have to do with sexual things and with food. Um, what can you eat and what can you not eat? Um, kosher regulations. Um, there are purity laws um, in Leviticus and... and um, uh, rules and regulations about uncleanliness in women um, when they're menstruating, um, which is the kind of thing one would expect from a male-dominated um, culture that shows some fear of the mystery of birth. Okay, uh, yeah, we don't have to get into all that, but, 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 but again, it, it's an, I'm just saying, he raises this issue in the selection I asked you to read, uh, and it had to, um, uh, the, the, the point is that there was um, a, a second person acknowledgement um, between you and me and me and you, between all of us together in moral community that we should not steal from one another and we should not kill one another without, um, without uh, moral justification, and that moral justification comes from the obligations that we owe one another. It's, it's sort of self, it's, it's referential back to the realities of our relationship in moral community. That's how I'm understanding this. So um, it's repositioning um, the God piece a little bit. It's not a traditional, it is not a, it is not by any stretch a traditional defense of divine command ethics. Okay, I can acknowledge that. Is this issue of any interest to any of you? Um, these are the only notes I made and I can't find my article. <laughs> but if you've got um, some stuff out of Darwell you would like to talk, talk about, I would be happy to um, 
either send it back out to you or, or offer what comments I have. No. Uh, Lloyd, uh, in fact, we were we were discussing some things, some issues before <laughs> in the coffee, and I I want to uh, uh, amend uh, about what you are. Uh, talking about now and uh, the reading of Darwin's uh, okay. books, uh, the concept of uh, accountability in, Dar in Darwin's terms, the concept of second personal, and uh, let me ask you something uh, about that. Uh, uh, I heard, I, I, I've read Darwin and I heard him, I saw him, and oh. I make him questions about what he understood by uh, that and one question I made to him is, uh, Professor, I think your concept of accountability and second person uh, commitment is too contractualist, I said to him. <laughs> <laughs> In the sense that uh, it presupposes that uh, we are only accountable to each other if we recognize each other uh -huh. as people as accountable people, right. as people that can understand themselves as duty bearers, as accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and so I can demand of you something. If I demand you, mm -hmm. I recognize that you understand the demand, and yeah. I also uh, understand that. And both of us mm -hmm. are people in the same sense, uh, accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember if I made the question in this terms, but this is the, 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 the understanding. The consequence, and what about the children? What about uh, the babies? What about the newborns? What about the common people? What about the vegetative state people? Uh, what about all other people? And what about the animals? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are accountable to them or not. Uh, they are not, of course, people uh, that can bear duties. And, uh, uh, I think he, uh, uh, he didn't understand my question. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, this is something uh, I, I think we can uh, uh, develop uh, uh, beginning with Darrow's account. Uh, the, the idea that uh, I can uh, live in a community with people uh, that are fully understood as persons, even though not all of them are like you and me, or right, they right. Uh, yeah. accountable in these terms. Yeah. Uh, be, and this is something I, I think must be explained. Uh, uh, because we, of course, uh, even though if we don't have the same uh, 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 view about vegetative state people like uh, Terry uh, Schiavo, uh, 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 we can, even if, uh, for example, Peter Singer that says uh, Terry Schiavo, Karen and Quinlan, uh, my students know what I'm talking about, people with in a vegetative state that they don't, uh, people that don't have any more consciousness. Uh, even if you agree that those people are not people anymore. Of course, that. Well, they're still people. Huh? They're still people. We're talking about persons. Or persons, yeah. Uh, there is a problem of <laughs> the plural of person, and okay. uh, the sometimes okay. we say people. But, okay, uh, okay. Uh, as okay. Long as, you, as long right. as you're right. You're right. You're fair, right. fair enough. Yeah. Maybe, as Maybe as they are only people, but not persons. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, if you understood my point that I said I, to you in the, I, I, in the I do. interval, they are persons. They right. should be considered as persons. Right. Uh, but if we, if we consider them as persons, mm -hmm. uh, and we accept uh, Darrow's description of second personal uh, mutual commitment mm -hmm. or relationship, how we can mm -hmm. uh, describe this kind of uh, relationship? What kind of relationship we have toward children, toward uh, 
to, to the newborns, to the, that's, that's, I think it's, it's something that must yeah. be, for, for of course we can sympathize with them okay. in the third personal uh, view, Darwin's person, uh, okay. uh, in, in the third personal yeah. sense, yeah. but the second personal is the point. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, um, when, when you confronted with him, when you raised this question, you said you, you said to him that he's um, uh, too contractarian. Was, was, he, was he objecting or did he not understand that? Was that a particular part of what you presented him with? No, I think I, uh, um, the, the, I couldn't present the question okay. uh, quite okay. clearly to, to, okay. to him. Okay. And so he simply obviated the, the yeah. question. Well, okay, okay. well, okay. Um, there, there's an awful lot to address in there, and I'm not going to spend the whole time doing this, but, but um, be, because part of what you're, when you're raising the question about the moral community and the second person relationship, um, the second personal, you are asking the question, what is a person? And I understand this is your, your question, and that's a profound question, and it's a central question. Um, since you're a physician, it's a central question in um, uh, biomedical ethics. Clearly, you know, because we have these, oh, oh gosh, there are, there are these physical conditions that people suffer that um, raise questions about whether personhood is still present. And if you can make the claim that we no longer have, a person is a moral category. Again, I just said that, you know, it's not a scientific category. Um, and if we can show um, through um, uh, CAT scans and all sorts of um, evidentiary um, technological means that a person has lost irretrievably, cannot get it back, um, their capacity, not only their actual function, but a capacity for interacting with other people um, with interacting with the environment, with understanding themselves as a subject of, um, of experience. And, and we could go on and on. Um, you know, what, what defines a person? And we could establish criteria. If, you know, you could say this is no longer a person, and one of the things you could do, pull the plug. Okay? You could pull the plug. Or you could give that extra little dose of morphine without thinking that the death that is going to happen is a killing of a person, a murder. Okay, you're exempt from that. And uh, the, the, the principle of double effect has kept all kinds of physicians who do hospice work out of jail. Okay, that's my theory on that. Um, the question you're asking is, you know, what who gets admitted to the moral community, how and why. And you, you know, even raise issues about animals. I've never met anybody who thought an oyster deserved to be in the moral community, but you can find people who think that dolphins ought to be. That um, if we start to establish criteria for what it means to be a person, um, a capacity for language use, self-consciousness, self-awareness, um, a capacity for interactions with others, being in relationship to an environment. Um, there, uh, you, you know, where some of the first times that we got involved in that, this question had to do around the abortion question. Because if we establish that a developing form of human life is a person, we can't abort it. You don't kill persons. Okay, fifth commandment, that, okay, we don't kill persons. But like I said, there are people who think um, uh, you're not a person until you're crowning. There are other people who think you're a person from the moment of conception. That's a big, long gap. That's a nine-month gap between what people's opinions about that are. The personhood question does not get settled by, um, uh, by science. And people who have come up with these criteria, um, there's a famous article by Mar Mary Ann Warren where she lays out uh, seven or eight criteria of personhood and they include some of the things I just said. And she said, if we look at a developing form of human life, 
um, it actually doesn't have all those different criteria of persons until two years old. So the title of her article will talk about abortion and infanticide. And a lot of people who do work in abortion will raise questions about infanticide because if you kill, if you don't actually have all these criteria of personhood in place and functioning until you're two years old, if you were to kill a one-year-old child, are you committing murder? Are you killing a person? Now, the reality is that um, we, we don't do that, okay? The reality is that personhood and admission to the moral community is something we confer on a developing form of human life and we do it at different times. Um, I actually have generated an argument where I say we confer that personhood um, at, the, at the moment a woman who is pregnant makes a promise to the fetus to bring it to term. Because now we have a moral, promise keeping is a moral term. It's a moral institution. And if you use promise keeping, um, it's also a floating notion that um, a woman, as soon as she finds out she is pregnant, um, is so thrilled at the prospect that she makes the promise to, to bring the fetus to term and starts doing things to make sure it happens. Maybe she stops um, drinking all those um, uh, diet Cokes and uh, makes sure that she calls her obstetrician and goes in, and, but she starts doing all the things that show that she cares and this is, this is a reality. Okay, so, um, you know, it's a floating notion, but it's also a moral notion. We, est establishing biological criteria for personhood, um, when personhood is a moral notion, seems to me to be a bad game to play. And it has done nothing but lead to um, confusion and alternative viewpoints. So when are you a person? Well, um, as soon as there's conception or um, what's the old Aristotelian thing that, that Muslims um, still use? What is it, the 14th day? Or when quickening takes place? Or when brain waves show up? Or when we think a fetus is experiencing pain? How could we possibly know that there's enough brain um, and nervous system construction to think that there could be an experience of any, I mean, it's, there is so much that we do not know and I don't think can ever know about these kinds of issues. They get very complicated. Um, and then we, then we go to the end of life and you have to deal with these things and is somebody who's in a persistent vegetative state still a person? Um, if they lack the capacity Okay, they lack the capac they have lost the capacity to be in relationship, to be the subject of experience. They cannot experience anything anymore. Are they a person? Are you doing anything wrong if we turn off the respirator and they die? Are we doing anything wrong? These, um, these philosophical questions about personhood um, one of the reasons I've gotten interested in, in, in bioethics is because these classic philosophical issues are practical issues in, in um, the field of medicine. They're, they're everyday kinds of issues and um, people who are doing ethics in that area are, are facing really profound, um, profound issues. What does all this have to do with Darwell? Well, you're, you're, you're talking about a moral community. You're talking about who gets in and, and what it means to be on that horizontal um, plane and what are the obligations. Well, the moral community takes it upon itself to confer a status of personhood on um, a developing form of human life. There can be disagreements about when that kicks in and there are disagreements about when that kicks in. Um, in the United States, the Roe versus Wade decision said we've got a trimester scheme and a woman who wants to get an abortion in the first 14 weeks of pregnancy can do it. No questions asked. Second trimester, questions are asked. Third trimester, no, except in, um, as Roe put it, to save um, a life or to address the health of the mother. That's all been changed, 
okay? But that's the way it was set up. And we can ask these questions at the end of life. Um, if you're in a coma, can we pull the plug? No. But if you're in a persistent vegetative state, what about that? Okay. What do we do with a newborn that is um, born with um, anencephalitis? Uh, and encephaly, I mean, uh, uh, this is when a baby is born and there's actually a defect in the in the skull, and there's no there's no neocortex functioning. This is a form of life of human life. It's human. There is no question that it's human. If we were to do a, you know, take some cells out of it and run it under the electron microscope and all that. It, it's not a mouse, it's not a chicken, it's not a goose, it's a human being. But it has absolutely no capacity to ever be in relationship, to have self-awareness. Are we doing anything by stopping treatment? Are we doing anything wrong if we actually gave it an injection, which is what I heard Peter Singer say he wants to do? Why would you continue this suffering? Suffering is not a good thing, okay? Um, why would you continue? This is suffering not for the, there's nothing there to experience suffering. It's not the suffering of, the, of this newborn. It's the suffering of the caretakers of the nurses who have to be there. The doctors are not going to be around it all the time, but the nurses are going to be there. They have to deal with it. What is the, what is the pain on them for something like this? So um, these, these are uh, you know, profound issues, and I, I think that um, Darwell's notion of the second person is a way into thinking about um, um, the obligations that we have towards others, and it's a way of um, perhaps thinking about how religious ethics would, would come in and have a role to play too. And, and again, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, I'm gonna have to try to figure it out in the next couple of weeks, but because um, I have to do a presentation on physician-assisted suicide, and I'm um, trying to think of a religious response that might say, there are certain situations where this is something that would not be wrong, that is morally permissible, okay? And, and from a Christian perspective. And that, that's a tricky thing to think about. It's a difficult thing to think about. Um, but that's one of the reasons that bioethics, for any of you who happen not to be in bioethics, it's one of the reasons it's kind of an exciting area to be in because these are very provocative issues and they require a great deal of thinking and there are some just wonderful people who work in the field and um, um, so, so I'm, I'm sorry I've gone on I wasn't planning on talking that long about it but but it, it's it's um, uh, um, I, I just was I actually was curious whether he responded to the <laughs> to the notion that you may have said he was too contractarian because I'm not quite sure what what that means either, uh, you know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know what that would, um, it, it is a perspective that says we, um, we are obligated um, to one another and it is, is based upon our relationships to one another and we enter into an agreement, when it, back to the punishment issue, um, if we got a contractarian view, the reason you could punish me is because in the contract um, with society, I have basically said that you can, if I violate the norms, a contractarian um, contractualism or whatever phrase you want to use for that, is basically saying that I have given my consent to you punishing me if I perform this violation and same goes to you. Um, that's that's the the contract that we have, um, so it, it it you know it that's one of the ways we can connect to that. So, uh, other questions or issues that you might have. I, I'm sorry, I know this isn't really a response, you know, a, a great response to this, but it's 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 a that's a complicated question, and. Um, well, yeah, it's a very complicated question, and and um, better 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 minds than mine have worked on it. <laughs> uh 
Uh huh. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. That's great stuff. I, I want just one thing I would say is um, there may be some help with this issue by rethinking. We, we talked about the um, yesterday. Um, we kind of started this whole thing off talking about the moral point of view, and we talked about universalizability and impartial justice, and we talked about um, um, beneficence or benevolence. It can go. There are differences in what those mean in English, but it's it's it, it means um, um, concern for the other. It means taking the other into account. It is a second person notion. I think um, often refers to a benevolent person is a kind person, and that's why if we invoke beneficence as a concept, that would explain why. Um, you feel shame um, if you, uh, you know, douse a cat with gasoline and set it on fire, or when you see somebody do that. Um, that cat is not recognized as a thou, an I thou, okay? It's not a second person. We haven't given it that kind of status, but we do have a reactive attitude towards this kind of an activity, and where does that come? It violates something core to the moral point of view, that to be a human being uh, morally constituted means that we don't do things like that. Why? It violates benevolence. It, 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 is, it is harsh and cruel, and um, there would be um, some things to bring in through the concept of benevolence that would allow us um, maybe we can't apply in a strict sense the second person thing because of the way we have defined it, okay? But we can still have a reactive attitude towards somebody who's cruel to animals or, or, or something like that. The, the, the other thing that you were raising, um, you, were, you were provoking the concept of empathy, you know, to empathize with another person. Uh, you know, to, to get in the other person's shoes and all that. But I think, it was, I think it was Darwell who actually wants to draw some distinctions between empathy and sympathy. 
and who sees the sympathy notion as a more important notion in some respects because um, uh, when I express sympathy for you, I am seeing your situation and um, the, it's not just that I, see I can empathize with you in kind of an impersonal way, right? Um, I can empathize because, oh, your father just died. Well, you know, my father, I, yeah, my father died. And um, I, can, um, I can empathize with what you're going through. I can recognize, there's a recognition, and it can be kind of impersonal, and empathy can function like that. I think that's one of the things Darwell said. But sympathy means that your father died, and I'm concerned, uh, not about your father. I'm concerned about the grief you're going through. Um, and my, my sympathy is directed towards you as a person who has experienced something. And it's for your sake that I have these feelings. It's not impersonal. It really is second order. So sympathy becomes something that's second order. Um, I, I wrote a little piece, and it's, I, it's in your readings, but it was... Um, um, it was talking about the death penalty where um, I actually am critical of empathy. And, you know, part of the objective of, a, of an educational process is to expose you to the world, um, expose you to difference, and make you more empathetic with people. We talk about that all the time. We use that language. But in, in, in death penalty situations, um, they, they will allow um, people, um, family members, to come in and um, offer um, statements. They're called victim impact statements. And at the, at the sentencing phase of a capital trial, um, people will say how they've been hurt by this person over here who killed my son. And um, the jury sits there and listens to that and they empathize because who can't imagine um, anybody who's a parent, who can't imagine losing a child to a murderer, okay? And the empathy that goes into that um, winds up affecting impartial justice, which is another part of the, in, you know, the moral point of view. Um, so, you know, empathy, um, there's actually a, um, a professor at um, uh, Yale, um, his name is Bloom, I've met him, I brought him to my university to talk about this, um, but he wrote a book against empathy, and he's a really interesting guy, um, but it, it has to do with the idea that um, um, people who are empathetic focus in on individual situations like me as a parent on the jury focusing in on so-and-so who k killed my son or killed the son of this family. And um, it, it focuses in on individual situation and doesn't pay adequate attention to broader justice concerns. It focuses it and personalizes it and doesn't deal with justice issues um, in the main. What is the appropriate punishment for somebody who kills another person, okay? Um, anybody who is murdered, um, anybody um, is suffering a great loss, do we need to hear a victim impact statement to make a decision? So it, all of those things can come into play um, around this. But the sympathy and the empathy piece is interesting. And I think one of the things Darwell wants to do um, is, is give more currency, give more weight to um, what sympathy has to offer as a second person reality. And if that's the case, that could come back to, um, um, it's not technically second person, though it's not totally apart from it either, um, but it could explain why when somebody beats a dog or something, you there is a kind of sympathy that you really do care about the dog for its own sake. And it's, it's really a focus on your moral development as somebody offering sympathy rather than on the formal relationships between me and you in our second order horizontal moral community reality. So, um, so there may be something in all that uh, 
to figure out too. So, so um, questions, issues about that? <laughs> Are there, go ahead, please. Yeah. Let me change the subject. Okay. Okay. Sure. Um, my question is about the concept of punishment of Darrow concept of punish. Okay. It's not clear to me. Okay. But uh, we can try think about. Uh, uh, we can try imply the concept of punishment uh, from the second person standpoint of morality. Okay. Let, let me start uh, with the argument of the second person. Uh, standpoint, as uh, Gary Watson said in the, the review of the, the, the book of Darrow, uh, okay. he presents his, the argument in this uh, following. Uh, one, in engaging in deliberation, we must assume that there is a basis for accepting some normative reasons for action. If there is a basis for accepting any normative reasons for action, there is at least an equally good basis for accepting second personal reasons. Okay. And third, in engaging in deliberation at all, uh, we are committing to assumptions that entail that there is a good basis for accepting second personal reasons. Uh, my question is, uh, if you try to imply a concept of punishment, I think that uh, we can say that this uh, conception is a kind of retributivist conception of punishment. Okay. Maybe like a conception of Christian Bennett mm -hmm. or Anthony Duff, uh, uh, connecting the punishment as a communication role. Okay. I, th I okay. think that okay. it uh, could be made. I, I don't know. What, what do you think about this? Well, um, um, a, a commun well um, it seems to me that there is a contractarian notion running through Darwell. I think that's where you would locate him as opposed to, uh, I think his, his second um, personal notion is um, representing contract theory in, in, a, in a basic way more than something we would associate in an exclusive way with something like retributivism or uh, 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 utilitarianism. And, and, and remember, um, there was an article, I don't know if you re recall this, I, actually it's in the, um, the other one we read for today, where the, the statements actually made that Kant himself, as much as he advocates retribution, also has a secondary concern for social welfare. It's just not the primary one. It's not like he excludes it. Okay, so I, I think there, so we've got this, this contract perspective, um, and when it comes to questions of punishment, it seems to me, now and maybe I'm wrong, and I don't know if he's written more about this, and I don't claim to be, you know, I have not mastered by any stretch his um, his his works. You know, um, I've, I've read a, a couple of his things, and I don't know if he's addressed this, but it seems to me that there is room for a kind of retribution perspective, but it's closer to something like what we saw in Bennett. Um, um, there would be a process where um, there's an alienation from that wrongdoing alienates you from the community and the process that is open up is a retributive process that aims at restoring you to community. Because um, we don't want people outside the moral community or on, on the other hand, just we don't want people not to be engaged in the reality of second personal. Uh, uh, you know, the, the fact that you, and, and that's the contract piece of this, or it's a, a contract is another way of thinking. It's a more traditional, old-fashioned Lockean notion or something um, um, with respect to that. So um, I think there's, there's room in Darwell for punishment, and I think um, it, it has, uh, a, a, it has um, warmth with um, um, uh, the Bennett piece we read. Um, 
and it may have a, a kind of utility, there's a concern about the welfare of the community. So I think there is a, a kind of utilitarian contribution to it. It's just that neither, neither one of them, and, and there, there is a holding of people responsible. There is a, a dessert notion that, that, that would play off. I don't see how any of that is inconsistent with um, a second personal view of things, so. Do you, I mean, do you, do you, does that make sense to you or? or uh, okay, all right. I think that uh, we can make a distinction between uh, uh, a standard uh, retributivism and a negative retributivism. Uh, let me show the definition. In Tom Brooks' uh, book about punishment, he ma made the distinction between a standard view of retributivism like Kantian View uh, and the negative view of uh, the good view. And then in this case, I think that uh, you can uh, classify the Bennett and Duff and Darrow as a negative uh, kind of retributive uh, Because the contratarian view uh, about punishment is a negative uh, retributive a, a negative? Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, the, but the, things the, like the distinction is, uh, is uh, has the following. Um, the chapter, uh, as I agreed, uh, that with the good is claim a link between desert and proportionality. Okay. Link between uh, desert and proportionality. Call this the standard view of with the good is. A majority of with the good is adhere to this view. Although this chapter has also had, uh, stressed that retributivists understand the relationship between desert and proportionality in several different ways. This view of retributivism is sometimes called positive or moral uh, retributivism. A different view is negative retributivism. Mm -hmm. Negative retributivism rejects uh, the link between desert and propor pro proportional, proportional Punishment, but accept the view that desert is a necessary condition of punishment. They are that punishment is only justified if someone deserves to be punished. Okay. Okay. It, 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 it makes sense for you to distinguish between positive and negative. The, 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 let me just understand the, the negative is that um, the relationship between proportionality and it's not important it's, it's not important it, no it's right not a sufficient condition of okay. punishment okay. but it's a necessary but desert, condition but, for punishment they desert but the desert, guilt of the person the wrongdoing the, 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 the guilt of the person okay but 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 it's not a sufficient condition to determine uh, the measure of the penalty okay all right. I, yeah. I, okay. Well, I think that's a useful distinction. <laughs> okay. Are there thoughts the the rest of you might have about any of that? Okay. Um. Uh. We we've got a few minutes left. Um. I'm wondering if we should take, um, uh, let's see if there were a couple of, of points. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the article that you were um, given to read, it's kind of a long one, but part of the length is because the footnotes are so long. It doesn't actually take all that long to read. Um, if, if you're just looking at the text, is, is, is by um, uh, Angelo Corlett, and it's from the journal Philosophy, and uh, it's, uh, it's called uh, Making Sense of Retributivism, and it is also a defense of retributivism, uh, but it's trying to pay attention to the institution of punishment, and um, Part of what he does is criticize John Rawls, and so there's a lot of philosophy um, particulars that get raised in this, and um, he winds up giving a critique 
of um, Joel Feinberg and Karl Marx. You know, uh, so there are different positions that he he raises. But there there are a couple of questions. I mean, just to pull out, and rather, I don't want, want to go through this article in you know in some kind of detail. Um, but there are, there are some interesting questions to to raise. Um, one of them has to do with the the issue of mercy. Um, the question could be raised if I've got to, if I remember this now. Uh, it's a long day, um, but if um, if retribution is going on and we have a contract system as our ethical background, it means that I have entered into. Um, a contract um, with you so that if I violate um, the, the standards of the society, the moral um, uh, norms, the moral norms, um, that I submit myself to punishment. That's kind of what a contract theory would ask of you. And you do the same. So we live together in peace and harmony because if we don't, we are basically saying, I have made myself available for punishment. I have consented to punishment at the front end. Okay, I, this is one way to, I'm trying to make sense out of the mercy thing because one of the questions that comes up, um, I'm trying to think if this was in response to something about Feinberg and I don't quite re even remember how Coral feels about this, but the question is interesting, I think. Um, the question is, can there be such a thing as mercy in a retributive ethic that is based on this kind of contract? Because if in the contract I concede um, that I should, normatively, I should, ought to be punished, for violation of moral and social and legal norms, does it make any sense for me to even ask for mercy or for somebody to give mercy to me when um, the very perspective I have adopted says I agreed to punishment? And I don't know if I want to say I welcome it, but it's the basis of my position in the society. Any thoughts or react? Do you understand the, what is provoked here? Um, that um, should a person receive pardon in a contractarian ethic when the contract is set up such that um, I have acknowledged my willingness to receive punishment for what I'm doing? Now, it can be mitigated, okay? The, the judge can say, yeah, normally we hand out 15-year sentences for this, but because this is a first offense, because I like your looks, whatever, you're going to get, you know, six months, okay? It can get mitigated, but you can't receive. So that's, that's different than what I'm talking about or, or what they're talking about. The, it's different from being pardoned or excused. Um, from a punishment. Does the idea of mercy and forgiveness in this kind of a system um, from the legal authorities, forgiveness from the legal authorities, um, does it even make sense? Is it something that should not have any kind of a role in a retributive ethic? Is that a, is that a real question or does it... Well, it's one of the things that I got out of the article. <laughs> um, we do need to ask, and we need, do need to talk further about the the role of forgiveness and um, um, what it means for a reactive attitude to fade, and what has to go on in reconciliation efforts so that a reactive attitude of resentment is um, basically um, is eliminated, okay? And um, 
again, uh, resentment is not anger. Anger is, um, um, we do have an article in there about anger that is, is a pro-death penalty um, position that talks about anger as being an attack. Um, it's a, it's a, a very, very strong emotion that is demanding um, retribution. So there are different kinds of perspectives on, on, on some of these things. Um, uh, one of the issues that comes up is, is what would be a proportional punishment, proportional punishment in a retributive system. And um, uh, on, on page 94 of this article, I'll just uh, maybe direct you there to take a look at some point. Um, um, a proportional punishment for Corlett is something that should never be inhumane. Okay, we're thinking about trying to figure out proportionality in, in dispensing, distributing a punishment, okay, and um, dispensing justice. Um, and a proportional punishment that, that comes up, it, it should not be inhumane. Um, it's not a punishment that should be affected by like race, class, culture, um, religion, um, different kinds of status that you, that's the impartial justice thing from yesterday. Um, the dispensing of justice should not be affected by accidental features. This is, this is a common thing in ethics, you know, this is the impartial observer, the veil of ignorance, all, all those kinds of notions that are trying to lead us to impartial um, justice. And around the idea of punishment, it comes up that, that punishments should not be uh, affected by um, accidental um, features. Um, but here's an interesting one that, that comes up in the article, that um, a, an individual's criminal history should not be a part of discerning, deciding a punishment. In other words, a person's past should not be a part of um, the criminal history. Um, and um, let's see here. It's own, and then he wants to make the case. It's only. Um, um, It's only, a, a, a punishment can only return like for like in a strict retributive sense if we're talking about a humane situation. That's another qualification. So it wouldn't be a humane situation in a case of rape um, to say that returning like for like um, means that you rape somebody, I rape you. That's in, in, um, inhumane. Um, you poured acid in my eyes. We talked about that case yesterday. I get to pour, we get to pour acid in yours. Okay, that, that kind of thing. So, but I, I thought this one qualification about not paying attention to a criminal history um, because people who get charged with crimes, um, often the severity of the charge is affected by a a running through the computers to find out what kind of a criminal history a person has. And we're talking about the punishment shouldn't be affected by that, but the charge that you get could be affected by your criminal history. Um, and in, in, in the United States, um, yeah, we have um, uh, three strike laws. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but there are some states that have them. California is like the worst place for this. And the reason I say worst is because uh, this is establishing an arbitrary punishment over which a judge has no control. We have put into law um, punishment and punishment systems that are not controllable by judges. And, you know, the ancient ideal of going back to um, Greek ideas of reasonableness is that a judge should, um, somebody who's judging a case should take into account all kinds of factors. 
um, so that in deciding on a fair punishment, um, a reasonableness gets used. If it's taken out of the judge's hands and it simply goes to a statute, that if you meet the criteria of the statute, this is what your sentence is, these can be incredibly harsh. A third strike law means that the third time you are charged with a, um, a felony crime, and felony crimes can sometimes be determined by dollar amounts if you steal something. There are, there are people serving life sentences in the state of California, in the United States, um, for a third strike, which happened to be a, um, uh, a shoplifting thing. It was something that met the requirement of um, a felony and, and be, you know, um, there are habitual offenders and this was an attempt to be hard on crime and deal with habitual offenders. Um, so it's, it's um, punishments can be, and there are, there are mandatory sentences that also took, one of, the, one of the reasons mass incarceration has become such a big deal in the United States, we have the highest um, percentage of, of citizens in, in prisons of any country in the world, 2.2 million. We have a 330 million um, population. I think we're, we're third in the world. Um, and uh, the United States, uh, just above Indonesia, as it turns out. Um, and mandatory sentences are imposed for certain kinds of crimes and this came out of the war on drugs. We were getting tough on crime. We had politicians who won offices, including the White House, based on um, being tough on crime. So very harsh um, sentencing requirements which got into law as mandatory sentences. So um, if you're, again, up on a, a second offense or something for a, a punishment, um, you could wind up with a 10-year uh, sentence for two ounces of marijuana or something like that. And, um, um, and again, the, the punishments that are, that are laid down, um, you, you can raise questions, are they proportional? Um, are they proportional? Are they humane? In, in African American neighborhoods, um, not having the ability to decide individual cases means that a minor drug offense may lead to taking a breadwinner in a family that is struggling um, out of um, circulation and lose the capacity to provide economic support for the family. Uh, if judges had abilities to respond to those situations, the sentence might be community service, but something that would not take a person away from their ability to contribute to the family. But these punishments and the systems of punishment that have been set up have put people in prison taken them out of their communities, and it's led the communities to greater and greater poverty. That's what's happened. And um, that's why it's not a happy situation up north there um, with respect to this. And people are starting to pay some attention to it. Um, there have been a couple of books that have made a, a big impact on it. But um, anyways, the question here is what is a proportional punishment? And um, I would simply say in support of raising that question that we need a use of reason and sympathy and, um, ab about some of these things rather than um, um, we need somebody to explain a situation about what a person's going through rather than um, this um, harsh, impersonal uh, viewpoint where if you do this, this is what happens to you. There needs to be more flexibility in, in that. And, and prison is clearly not a solution to most of these problems. Um, if, uh, so uh, this is not a, we're not doing a, a course here on, on prisons or anything, but um, 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 they, they are not settings where um, people um, are going to receive rehabilitation. They're not environments where um, even, even drug 
of, of things are, um, are, are dealt with. Um, you know, there's a difference between treatment for a drug offense and punishment by imprisonment for a drug offense. And um, there are people advocating for reform in all this, and there are people advocating for what's called decarceration, um, getting people out of prisons and into different settings where they can deal with these things. So, anyways, um, um, if, if you've got, we can ch take a look at the Corlett article. If you've got some um, issues you'd like to raise tomorrow as a result of that, we'll, we'll talk about it. And um, uh, we'll, we'll take a look. Um, um, the, the Lloyd Weinreb article is by a major um, uh, professor at Harvard Law School. It's by a, a, a lawyer who wrote that. And the, the, the Zur article is also interesting. But I would also ask you, if, if you haven't, to take a look at my little piece on uh, capital punishment and just punishment. Um, and as I said, when I uh, contacted Fulbright um, to tell them I was interested in, in, in this project, I, I said I've written on just punishment. And it, it's, it's not that I've written a lot on it, but I've written on it and I've given thought to what it would be. And it's not all that far from some of the things we, we've talked about. And I would like to give you a different kind of philosophical background um, than we're finding with uh, Kant and um, the utilitarians and even with the contractarian viewpoint. Um, this is something that's appealing to natural law. But then again, I, I've got to explain what I mean by that. And it's, it is different from what you may know of, of natural law, because natural law is proposed so much around um, um, God and the role that God plays in all that. And, and I understand that, um, but I think there are some ways to uh, think about this a little differently. So I would like to have that chance to, to do that with you. So, okay, are we good? Yeah, sorry if I kept you a little late, I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you. Oh.